Hey, everybody. The session is specifically focused on persistent memory, PMEM use cases. You can probably hear us use a few acronyms or two. Uh, where SQL Server 2022 can take advantage of persistent memory and better processing. And in this session, we're going to cover 2019 and 2022 support for persistent memory. We're also going to start with a very high level overview, overview of uh, SQL Server IO, along with some like supporting key Windows Server 2019 and 2022 capabilities. We're also going to co um, cover SQL Server compression with Intel Quick Assist technology. Uh, uh, this is going to give us backup compression in order to get faster backups with better capacity, even when your servers are under load. It's really cool technology. Really quick on me, I'm going to be fast on this. My name is David Pless. I'm a senior SQL program manager for Microsoft that focus on the SQL Server storage engine. Uh, previously, if you've seen my content out there, I have a lot of stuff on Azure SQL Virtual Machine, and you'll see a good bit on SQL Server security as well. But VM is probably the primary content, but you've seen a lot of stuff recently on the storage engine. And Darren? I'll be even faster. Yeah, I'm Darren Freimuth. I'm a senior <laughs> solutions architect at uh, Intel Corporation. I'm focusing on Microsoft cloud and database technologies. And um, to the right, there are some images of things that help define the things I'm interested in. So, and then, we call it soccer, right? Still call it soccer, soccer in the States. A lot of soccer. Yeah, a lot of soccer. <laughs> lot of Same football. here. Same here. All right. So let's like reflect on your uh, current infrastructure. But it's a good conversation, a good thought to have. Um, let's think of your really your environment as it is today. So you probably made a strong investment in hardware, at least your customers have. Storage, separate servers, separate systems, all tiered platforms, right? And some of these platforms may be running different applications. You may have some stuff that's a little dated, some uh, varied support, maybe even like SQL Server 2012, uh, varied flavors of Windows 2012, 2016. And then there's a lot of investment on the SAM level, right? And all this is a good investment, but a lot of customers, especially the ones that we've been talking to, are finding that the investment doesn't necessarily meet the demands coming from analytics, big data outcomes, machine learning, and other stuff like that. And while all this is happening, the data volumes are also exploding. So there's a lot more data at rest and, uh, than ever before with only a small amount of that ingested de data ever processed. And then we continue to produce more data at record levels, but we're expected to be able to analyze it in real time, right? So what we're going to cover is some of the uh, SQL Server 2022 capabilities around persistent memory and how we can build upon them to take advantage of these technologies and improve the situation that I laid out. And we're also going to talk about the Intel Quick Assist technology and how we can improve backup performance and capacity. And that's specifically a SQL Server 2012, or I'm sorry, a SQL Server 2022 feature and capability. By the way, we're also be going to be talking about, we're in the current private preview state for SQL Server 2022. So as we uh, have these conversations, keep in mind that some things, slight things may change between now and public preview general availability. Okay. All right. So your data has always been in memory, and this is really just kind of setting the stage for things. Like in your in the database engine, the assumption is that data re resides on disk, right? And we use memory to make data access faster, but the primary data residence is on disk. So the storage engine is designed with this premise in mind. Data is divided into pages, and then it provides an efficient method to transfer data into or from disk into memory. So the buffer pool is going to mimic this page structure to make it easier to transfer from data from disk into memory. And then when we, whenever we access data, it's from memory, OK? Now, we can't read a page of data without first putting it into the buffer pool. And then we keep pages in the buffer pool as long as we can, so then subsequent access is faster. So since the beginning of SQL Server, the world of data storage has been divided into these tiers of what we perceive as like really fast, volatile memory and then slower, stable storage. And then you're gonna, your investment, right, kind of keeps that, that scenario in mind, right? So this story, though, is, is definitely changing. So disks, of course, are getting faster, and me but memory is also becoming non-volatile. So in short, the lines are starting to blur. And what we call disk or memory in turn, is becoming somewhat irrelevant. It's all storage. And this storage has different characteristics, such as speed, capacity, latency, et cetera. 
And this can be used to store data either temporarily or permanently. So in a world where like the memory and disk are converging, the data engine needs to be able to take advantage of this and, and take advantage of these kind of evolving scenarios. And this is what's gonna get us into persistent memory. So what we're gonna do is an overview of persistent memory and talk about what Intel persistent memory options are available. Okay. So as you can see from the slide, okay, so we have some hot data that is more frequently accessed as opposed to cooler data. The SQL Server copies data from physical disk, this is the cooler data, into the DRAM memory, this is the warm, hotter data. Accessing memory is gonna be typically faster than ac accessing disk storage. And as said, in the previous slide, a page read will always copy data from disk into the buffer pool. Okay, or, or in DRAM in this case. All right, so you may have seen something like this before, but we've enhanced this graphic with persistent memory improvements in mind. And we have this buffer pool that maps to the very fast DRAM. SQL Server needs to quick access, so the more frequently accessed pages in memory, the better. And of course, SQL data that's less frequently accessed remains available on disk storage. We need to select this data at some point and bring it into memory. Um, so we're gonna need to access our disk storage to be, be efficient. And remember, this is an ongoing trend that we need to continue to analyze more and more of this data that is currently at rest. So the performance differences here from the technologies should be evident. We have various tiers of storage from our traditional spinning disk, which are slower but cheaper, to the next tier of SSDs. And then we have a mix of traditional hard disk, disk attached SSD, um, a PCIe NVMe um, with storage tiers going from milliseconds, microseconds, uh, nanoseconds, compared to the upper tier of what is it, 80, 80 nanoseconds, than what is and uh, what your DRAM typically provides. Okay, now the gap. This is the opportunity to fill, right? And this gap outlines less than 100 microseconds with SSDs versus less than 100 nanoseconds with volatile DRAM. There's two core technologies, okay, um, that Intel has that reduces latency while providing a level of persistence. One of these is the Optane SSD and the other is the Intel Optane persistent memory. So our focus is gonna be initial in this beginning of this presentation on these two tech topics. Um, as they uh, improve SQL Server performance. And then later I'm gonna get into how this aligns to various versions. So this is a layered approach with hardware capabilities, operating systems, and the API that can leverage the hardware. And then we're gonna talk about how SQL Server can take advantage of these technologies. Okay. All right, so this, there's so much, Darren, there's so much material out there on this, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to like super simplify this, okay? So you can say just by looking here at the traditional path as we access data, you can see in a glimpse that there's a lot more that you have to go through, a lot more hoops that you have to jump through in order to access data to the, to the left compared to the right. So if you think like, what would you have to do for a simple 8K operation? So with uh, your storage class memory, we can bypass many of the stacks, like with uh, regular NVMe drives. The next level, what do you we call what do you call this at Intel? The, we're, I'm saying DAX access. What do you call that at Intel, Darren? So in the in the PMEM space, we call this uh, app direct mode. App direct mode. Okay. So in that app direct mode on the right, this bypasses all of the kernel stack, and we're going directly into memory for load and store operations. So there's a whole lot less cycle spent in the kernel to return data, um, as well from like compared to like tr traditional storage class memory, and then finally to the DAX mode. Okay. So it should be noted that Windows Server and Linux fully supports both, okay? So you're saving on just kernel time, computation time, and I.O. as well. Okay, so now that we covered that very high level, and we're doing this all in the sake of time. So Darren, what can you tell us about these memory modules and storage tiers? And that's what I'm gonna jump into here, and Darren, feel free to jump in and take over. Go to the next slide. We can go to the next slide. But, um, so you just pointed out the, the, the space between that traditional hard drive and the DRAM. Um, you can go forward. Okay. Um, it is being filled by multiple storage options. Um, so um, 
at the top up here is the Intel Optane Persistent Memory, also called PMEM for short. Um, PMEM is enabled on systems with the third generation Intel scalable processors. Um, also, um, it operates on the DRAM bus and um, as the picture shows here, they, they look a lot like a DIM package. Um, uh, but they're very, yeah. but they're different. Um, they can be used as a volatile or not or persisted memory, both, and um, they can be added into systems in place of DDR memory. Um, and their sizes range uh, up to uh, 512 gigabyte, which would be larger than most DIMMs. Okay, so it would it will take up a slot. Is that correct, Darren? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. It will. Um, there's some benefits to that, though. I mean, uh, the. Yeah. So, so below PMM on the right side there um, are Intel Optane SSDs. Um, the Intel Optane SSD P5800X um, it provides the most uh, the it provides the performance needed for most data intensive workloads um, with a combination of a uh, very low latency, fast throughput, and high endurance. Um, they're ideal for fast caching and tiering of hot data. Um, so these drives are incredibly fast and can reach up to 1.6 million IOPS of random or read or write um, performance. Um, so one of the great benefits of Intel Optane Media is that it allows for much larger numbers of lifetime write cycles. At 60 writes per day is greater than 10 times the endurance of many NAND SSDs. So um, it, wow. it easily fits in that middle space between storage space where fast caching is required. Okay. And uh, let's see. Uh, oh, good. and to the next slide, I guess. Okay. So next, um, I'd like to uh, come back and fill in some, yeah, some details on Intel Optane uh, PMM. Um, like, what is Optane? So, a lot of people throw that name around. Intel Optane is a, a media um, technology with a number of important advantages over other memory options. Um, Intel Optane enables write in place updates um, that avoids extra updates. Um, it's a byte addressable like DRAM and non volatile like NAND and has a read write latency between the two. Um, you know, most importantly, I guess, with um, Optane is it's created with new materials purpose designed for high endurance in mind. This endurance advantage means that Optane has sufficient endurance to act as system memory. Um, okay. So, um, so Intel Optane PMM um, puts Optane in, in a DDR form factor, or the Series Two Hundred puts um, in a DDR form factor, putting it on the DRAM bus. In con in combination with third generation Intel scalable processors, this fills the gap capacity. It fills the gaps in capacity, persistence, and security produced by DRAM. Um, so what are the, you know, I mentioned, um, capacity, persistence, uh, and security gaps. Um, what are, what do I mean by those? So, so first PMM allows you to have a much larger memory capacity at much lower cost. When using 512 PMM modules, you can have up to four terabytes of PMM and two terabytes of DRAM per socket. So on a two socket Xeon system, this could give you 12 terabytes of addressable storage. Um, so as Dave was talking about earlier, um, there's a lot of data that sits out there that you know we don't address all the time, but we we want to have it have it be there and be addressable. Mm -hmm. um, this enables a larger database. This large, enables a larger database capacity um, densities, allowing uh, you to consolidate and reduce your server footprints. Okay. Um, so. PMEM also allows you to persist your data in a byte addressable memory. This, this provides much faster access to the data than say, you know, uh, an SSD where you have to, you know, look, seek for it. Or um, th this persistence ensures that your data and log rights will not be lost. Oh, let me see. Yeah. Oh yeah. The persistence, uh, the persistence data allows that your data and log rights will not be lost um, in the case of um, unforeseen inter interruptions. And as far as security goes, um, all data that's persisted in uh, PMM is encrypted 
by uh, AES-256 encryption. So this enhances the security of the data without uh, requiring any code changes. So um, in places where you need large capacities of persistent data, Intel Optane allows you to securely and affordably boost the memory capacity per socket. So next, Dave will take us through more how, uh, more how PMM is used by SQL Server. Excellent. And, and I'm sure there's like Intel documentation that kind of compares and contrasts the different scenarios. Yes. Like, okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, yeah. We're, yeah, we'll talk here about kind of the, we're going to get into um, how Alliance to SQL Server. Um, also talk about like the, the memory feature family. As we know, you know, SQL Server can be very IO intensive. So, you know, let's think about IO in terms of SQL Server. You know, what do we do with IO? We read pages, we write pages, we do transaction log IO as blocks. So you have to really kind of think about this with the, this blurred persistent memory scenario. You know, how does SQL Server take advantage of this? How can we use it as a drive? And wh what are some of the other ways that SQL Server could use persistent memory in other modes? Okay, and that is gonna, gonna line us up to this discussion here. So, and this is just really high level. You'll see this like in-memory feature family. Um, the concept of an in-memory database, we're talking about like a database system that has been designed to take advantage of larger memory capacities on modern platforms, database platforms. So an in-memory in database, it could be relational or it could be non-relational. Okay, so it's assumed that the performance advantages this is, I think this is an important piece here. I think um, then uh, assumed that the performance advantages of an in-memory database system is mostly because the, it's faster to access data that is in resident in memory rather than data residing on the fastest available subsystem, right? That's kind of like a traditional thought. However, most um, SQL Server workloads, many of them actually, can, can fit their entire working set in available memory, especially for your in-memory LTP type of environments. So memory, uh, many in-memory database systems uh, can persist data to disk and may not always be able to fit the entire data set in available memory. So a fast volatile cache that is in front of a consider considerably slower but durable media, this is the predominant scenario for relational database workloads, right? but this necessitates a particular approach to workload management. So the opportunities presented by faster memory transfer rates, greater capacity and persistent memory enables the development of features that can give us some new approaches. We think about like our, the di difference between traditional, the storage class, and then the, the DAX mode and how that could potentially relate to SQL Server. You can kind of see the opportunities. And this is where we're really gonna kind of break this down and step through these scenarios, okay? So this is gonna be a quick overview, but these are like, think these are gonna be scenario-based, okay? So first is the uh, PMM as a block device. In this scenario, um, I have on the slide, think of PMM as a storage tier. The SQL Server storage engine will treat PMM just like any drive storage. So why would this be valuable? So with a purchase of a larger persistent memory module, you could place your data and your log on technology that performs seeks with less than one microsecond on the um, Optane persistent memory, and then less than 10 microseconds for Optane SSD, okay? Plus, and here's, this is a really good piece here. This is one of those scenarios that, that goes back a bit for SQL. This, will, uh, this situation will support any version of SQL Server 2014 and up. Okay, so it's not just 2019, 2022. I'll kind of lay out where the benefits are in other versions. Okay, so the next is the persisted log buffer um, with cache. You may have heard of this is the, the tail of the log scenario. This was introduced in 2016 and it should be noted that it was in-memory OLTP that drove this work. So if you, if you have a Hecaton based application with OLTP and are testing the next bottleneck became the transaction log. And the reason was, uh, that this kind of found is while we're improving in-memory LTP, we could see how fast we could get, of course, but we're moving locking latches and spin locks, right? But we noticed that the next bottleneck was write log weights. 
And and because even with in memory OLTP, we we persisted to an in memory OLTP table, and then we have to write to the log. So that became the next bottleneck. And this is where persistent memory came in. So the transaction log has a buffer per database, right? We take the log transactions and we put them in log buffers in memory, and then based on policies for commit operations and checkpoints and lazy writes and all, and so forth, we then then write to disk. So there's a process where we say commit in SQL Server. So we take whatever's in those buffers, we write it to disk. The typical scenario for years is that this would be some sort of traditional storage. If though on persistent memory, and this goes back to the, what Darren was talking about. We know that the log buffer is already persisted, right? He, as Darren described, this is persisted. When we say commit, we don't have to perform any additional work to write to the log. So that means we don't have to worry about data loss, right? So this is the tail of the log technology, and it's been around since SQL Server 2016 SP1, okay? Now, the next is the enlightened I.O. This has evolved somewhat, okay? So if you dig into persistent memory, a good portion of the optimization, as we described like at the very beginning, is avoiding kernel switches, right? So we're, we're bypassing the I.O. stack to reduce the number of CPU instructions and in, in I.O. This is uh, called the direct access approach with the data and the log on persistent memory modules. So SQL can treat all of this like it's cached in the buffer pool. The beauty of this is you don't have to do any specific configuration in SQL to enable it. Right? You just put your data and log files on a persistent memory module, and then when you start SQL Server in this environment, it's able to bypass the kernel and avoid the latency of traversing the I.O. stack. Now, we did all of, all of this uh, to use persistent memory for storage. There wasn't any change. I didn't do an alter server configuration. All we did is put our database on storage, and we're suddenly faster. Previously, this feature was only available on Linux with 2019. But with uh, SQL Server 2022, and especially with improvements in the SQL Server uh, or Windows Server 2022, we brought this Enlighten I.O. feature to all SQL-based platforms. Okay. Last, definitely not least, is hybrid buffer pool. Okay. So what if SQL Server could just take persistent memory storage and just treat it like memory? This is the concept. What if we could take our persistent memory and just use it for the buffer pool? It doesn't matter if it's in DRAM or persistent memory. It just looks like the buffer pool to SQL. And this is why we call it hybrid buffer pool. Now, keep in mind that persistent memory modules are going to be slightly slower than DRAM, but definitely faster than storage, right? Even in DME. So to en enable this, all you have to do is an alter server command, and then we enable the hybrid buffer pool after a restart. You do have to restart in this case. Shown in the slide, there's no application changes, though. You don't want you to have to touch the apps. You may have to make a config change, but that's it. And then you'll you'll um, you shouldn't have to change your application again. SQL just sees it as memory. So how are we doing on time? By the way, we are at uh, twenty five minutes left. Twenty six minutes left. Okay, okay, that's a that's a good spot. I'm I'm gonna, I'll go quicker here, um, but you know because I just want to do this like really quick overview. So this is going to be a quick summary overview, and then we're going to jump into Intel, uh, the QAT. Okay, so. Again, and this is, again, summary. Remember on the persisted log buffer, SQL Server 2016 introduced support for non-volatile uh, DIMMs and the optimization called the tail of the log, right, caching, the tail of the log caching. This leverages direct access to persistent memory device in DAX mode to reduce the number of operations needed to harden the log buffer to persistent storage. You just configure a portion of the log buffer to be persisted, and the concept here is if you do a commit based on the fact that we are doing doing this on persistent memory, to your app, you go right back to the application and say, we're done. And then we just lazily write to the SSD drive for the log file itself, or to the log itself. Um, this is still persisted on the persistent memory module. And again, Darren pointed this out. If, if for whatever reason, SQL had to restart, right? It's persisted, which is really the beauty of the whole thing, right? As, as, as was laid out previously. Again, on the enlightenment of database files with the release of this on 2019, this was for Linux, right? So we introduced uh, the persistent memory support for Linux. This is now available on SQL Server 2022 and Windows Server. Again, rather than going through the file system and the storage stack, SQL Server leverages DAC support to place data directly onto the device. And this is greatly going to reduce latency and removes the overhead and calculations needed to trudge through the IO stack, right? So. A lot of improvements in that. Okay. 
and then again on buffer uh, hybrid buffer pole. Uh, but the hybrid buffer pole allows you to extend the buffer pole to persisted memory, and it's just seen as one continuous memory space by the SQL OS. So unlike Enlightenment, the idea here is we're optimizing for read workloads. And with a hybrid buffer pool, this is a SQL Server feature that takes advantage of DAX mode within the SQL Server engine. So we're bypassing the I.O. stack and directly accessing data, reducing latency and improving application performance. Okay. So just wanted to give that quick summary since we had, I thought we had a second, uh, a moment in time. How are we doing questions? Uh, are we good so far? Okay. Okay. Just want to check because we're shifting gears a little bit. We're going to talk about SQL Server backup compression. So Darren, take it away. Okay. So the next technology integration um, is SQL Server backup compression. Um, so we'll talk about why the hardware acceleration of your backups is important and then so then some specific details of around Intel QAT backup compression. Um, and then we'll follow that up with some numbers, um, performance numbers with SQL Server um, and QAT. Yeah. Let's see. Um, so next, I think there's a delay on the slide actually. I think there um, is a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why do we care about um, accelerating our backups? Um, as the amount of data that's being stored grows, and Dave talked about this a little bit earlier, you know, we're storing a lot more data. Um, it takes longer for our backups to complete and the size of the backups are growing um, as well. Um, it also seems like, you know, today's world, um, you know, the scheduling windows seem to be shrinking, right? So we have less time to complete those backups. And um, mm. <laughs> um, so many have probably implemented solutions to help mitigate these problems. You know, you could run your backups on secondary replicas. However, you know, even if you're running your backups on the secondary replicas, um, there could still be competition for CPU cycles depending on how you're using those secondaries. Um, you know, also the, the backup files generated, you know, they're still the same size even with those other, op other solutions. Um, so ultimately what we wanna do is reduce the size of our backup storage, you know, improve the speed of the database backups um, and database restores with as little impact on the workloads, you know, that are, that's running on our SQL servers. So using a built-in SQL compression can address the backup file size, but using software compression steals compute cycles um, from the main workload, you know, running your queries. So uh, the, the amount of, also the amount of time that, that the backup takes with software compression can vary depending on how much uh, CPU resources are available um, when it performs the compression. So, you know, what's, is there a solution? So a better solution is, is hardware acceleration or of, of the compression. Um, hardware acceleration provides a dedicated hardware to perform the, the specific compression tasks. Um, this dedicated hardware leaves the main CPUs free to do their tasks and is less likely to impact your SQL workloads. Um, hardware acceleration of compression allows for SQL Server to have faster backups, faster restores, and they don't impact your, your SQL workloads as much. Um, and it also has a pretty good uh, decrease on the backup size. Yeah, we have, Darren, we have customers that are in the position especially around the like holiday spikes, like everyone thinks about the, the mm -hmm. end of year holiday, holiday window, you know, where they're hoping to go uh, from, you know, red, red to black and, and, you know, turn a profit. But then you have those scenarios like that are really spiky, like tax, tax day, uh, tax day for those customers or um, yeah. you always, you always think about the, the florist, right? You know, you got what mother's day and Valentine's day in the States. Those are like really spiky workloads. So we have customers that are in the position where they're they're picking consistency versus orders because they their systems run so hot, they can't possibly do the backups and the maintenance and the other scenarios that they want to do in those windows. So they have to dial down. Mm -hmm. So in this scenario where you're running that hot and you have those databases that large and you're using compression, are we able to offload 
off of the system to a hardware solution? Is that that's what you're getting getting at here to to avoid putting yep. pressure on the base system? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's incredible from for like a, a scenario, SQL scenario. Okay, so I went to the next slide. I know there's a delay. Um, okay. Can you so, tell us a yep. little bit about this? Yeah, so Intel Quick Assist technology, um, Intel QAP for short, is a technology that implements hardware acceleration and improves performance across applications and platforms. Um, it includes acceleration for symmetric and asymmetric encryption, authentication, digital signatures, and and lossless data compression. Um, and it significantly increases the performance and efficiency of these standard platform solutions. So, you know, Intel QAT meets the needs that we discussed earlier um, for hardware acceleration of compression on SQL Server. So the, you know, future version of Microsoft's uh, SQL Server 2022 will integrate Intel QAT, and we should see a demo of this later, hopefully. Um, uh, it'll implement, uh, the integrate QAT hardware compression technology to um, accelerate backups and uh, compute intensive workloads. So in performance testing with QAT and uh, newer versions of Microsoft SQL Server, um, SQL Server is shown to have up to a 2.3 times speed up with database backups. Um, also, you know, SQL backups have seen, um, you know, up to, uh, it seems like 6% reduction in backup file sizes. Um, I think much, a few more. Um, over the built-in compression of SQL Server 2022. This means that over time, you will use less storage space to maintain your backups. Um, so how do you get a hold or, or how does how do you get QAT um, until QAT? So currently in today's world, QAT is um, provided by some quick assist adapters that can plug in the PCIe bus. Um, and there's also some specific Intel chipsets um, that OEMs might use that also integrate QAT. And in the future, um, next version uh, of Intel processors, QAT will be integrated um, into the Xeon scale of processors and will be more readily available. Uh, Intel QAT is also provided as a software library, um, providing software acceleration when you install the QAT driver. This is kind of important because if you have systems where you've used hardware you know, acceleration to backups and you need to restore that to a different system that may not have hardware available, um, you can always you know, get access to that because the software um, acceleration will take over. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, software is uh, a sa safety net, right? If you it's will. a safety net, yeah. Yeah. We do so have um, one question. Sorry. To does does this work when SQL Server is hosted in a hypervisor environment? So a hypervisor uh, support for for QAT. Yeah, so QAT is basically sits on the PCIe bus. Yeah. So as long as that's being exposed um, to the guests, um, yeah, it, should, it, it, it would work. Okay, excellent. So, um, this, yeah, and so we've done some testing with uh, actually I think some of the performance numbers I have were done in in a VM environment. Yeah, so um, it's a fair point. We <laughs> most everything we we test and analyze is either in some cloud platform or or hypervisor environment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So um, yeah. So with the you know with demands on SQL Server environments today, you know, QAT will help you maintain your SQL Server environments with more efficient SQL Server backups. And then I, back to Dave. Dave, Dave will tell us, walk us through how the syntax of this works. Yeah, right, right, right. It's a good, yeah. And I, I just answered that question there for you. So um, you can enable, by the way, some of this may change. We're, as I mentioned before, the SQL Server 2022, we're in, we're in private preview, um, you know, Public preview GA, you may see some some changes here. So we're giving you a little bit of this um, early. So you can enable hardware offloading um, on the server level by performing an alter server configuration and setting the hardware offload to on, which is disabled in the same way. Um, a server restart is required because you're actually bringing assemblies into the system. Um, and that software safety net, if you will, Darren, uh, that's also supported through, through this configuration here. Um, you also can use the uh, server property to verify the offloading capabilities been enabled. So the same way this may change now before, 
you know, between now and general availability as we're currently in private preview, again, as I mentioned. And then after a server restart, right, you should then select, highly recommend, <laughs> Running, running a server property command just to verify that the assemblies have been loaded and they're available for SQL Server 2022 to use. A uh, question I get a lot is, is like, okay, are we also going to have information in the, the, the startup? That's the intent um, is to say like, hey, these assemblies have been loaded and information about, about the underlying hardware. Um, if the feature is not available, then you would check the SQL Server and what is Airlog to address any issues and confirm that the device drivers and the QAT software assemblies and libraries are available. Okay, and then once you verify that the QAT feature is available to use, you can either run manually or schedule your backup. Um, in order to backup a database with QAT compression, you're just simply going to say, you know, run a regular backup statement, but append the statement with a compression and state the QAT deflate for the compression algorithm. If it, you know, you're gonna surface the error, uh, an error that is, um, if the statement was run and QAT is not available. Um, to use a traditional backup method, all you need to do is say um, backup database, just as you did before, and either with compression, having the algorithm equal to MS Express, or by simply saying compression, um, just without the compression because the default would would apply, right? MS Express. Okay. But this is also what you're gonna see coded as you're looking at the header and so forth for your for your back, uh, for your databases, uh, for your database backups, that is. Which you'll see here, right? Restore header only, it displays the compression algorithm. It's a QAT backup. We need QAT to be loaded, otherwise there'll be an error which tells the user to enable QAT to read a QAT backup. And we do have a we do have a demo. Um, so I will be walking through some of these pieces. So um, Darren, as we're like talking about the the benefits of QAT under load, hardware versus software. I mean, I, I know that we have you have some information here, some numbers to to talk about. But this is this could be a moving target. We could be improving upon these as well, right? I would expect. Right. This is this is early. We're giving early kind of views on this, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is just uh, some quick graphs. Some um, some of the um, the some benchmarking that we've done in the you know, early stages of the of QAT uh, integration. Okay. Um, so the orange bar here is the baseline on the on the left um, is the baseline that we um, the green bar shows uh, the backup when performing um, or the, the speed up when performing quick assist with the software compression so even with just software compression uh, we see a 1.4 times um, speed up in the SQL backup and then the blue bar um, on the left graph you know it shows what we've seen um, using a quick assist hardware adapter. Um, and that's, you know, 2.3 times faster than doing a SQL backup without SQL compression. Um, so and this kind of shows the speed improvements um, that you might see. Um, the graph on the right is okay. a kind of a similar, similar comparison um, under VMware um, or VM, actually uh, under, it's done in a VM context. Um, and you know the the speed up compression is not quite as great, um, but it's still much faster than uh, without um, compression or output. So, so, and we've talked about like the like I, I think I framed it like thinking about like that holiday window when when customers are under pressure. But there are some customers that are under pressure a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> I had, like I had another message on the screen is like. Uh, so Dave, talk about those customers as well. Like they're 100 percent of the time, they're they're burning it near 100 percent. So that difference between the blue bar, which is the hardware, right? That's the hardware offloading, and the green yes. bar, which is software only, Intel QAT compression. That variance could be even more pronounced, right? Depending on how hot you're running, is that fair? Like so, um, if I if I run it yeah. without, if I run it with, like if I'm trying to compress on a machine that's just taxed, I I could see even even a bigger bigger benefit from my offloading. That's true. 
Yeah, it, yeah. it depends on how much it was necessarily comparing software to hardware because yeah, with the hard, hardware compression it should um, offload to all that compression to you know external. You know, it doesn't doesn't tax the CPUs. So um, before I get into the demo, we have a, a a little bit of time I think for a question. The uh the the previous question was, hey, does does any of this work with SQL servers hosted in, in a hypervisor environment? And I think I framed it to you in terms of QAT. For PMEM, is that also supported in a hypervisor environment? What's the support yeah. for? Yeah, so in PMEM, it, it works a little differently with PMEM. Um, you, you generally, you know, it depends on how you, not to go too in depth with PMEM, but you, have, you still have, you know, memory mode and app direct mode. And, and most of the hypervisors, um, they sort of have native support for um, PMEM. Or okay. with them. And so you will get that same advantage that we were talking about for the database, but you'll get it for your, um, for your, your host. So your host will now have all that much more memory you can spread around to your guest OSs, right? So um, the guest OSs will see it, you know, as memory, just like it does today. Um, but, you know, you can get that advantage of 12 terabytes on your, on your host system, right? Okay. Two socket system, right? Um, okay. And you can, and, and that can be divvied up to your your guest systems, which what may be a, a database. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. I'm just going to check really quick to see if there's any other questions. I think we have a uh, we have someone in the room as well. That is, is there any questions from the room? Otherwise, I'm gonna I'm gonna go move over to the demo, and I think we 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 have plenty of time for the demo and other questions. I think we're good. All right, excellent. So, Sorry. in um, so and it, oh, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we got one question. Uh, okay. Ask, um, if you have a SQL Zero VM, do any of those currently support the hybrid buffer pool with the Octane P memory? Okay, so if you have a um, a, C, a SQL VM, yeah. um, mm -hmm. SQL Zero VM, a, C, a SQL Zero VM, do yeah. they support the Octane P memory? Oh, and Azure. Azure That's current. yeah. That. That's a good question. That I would have to check the check with my VM team on because that may be specific to the size of the VM. So we have in um, in Azure, we have different VM classes and sizes. So we have what we would consider to be memory optimized, compute optimized, graphics optimized. In the memory optimized space, um, we have M series, E series, those type of machines that have a higher memory profile and, and um, also carries with it compute profile. Those are the ones that I would, that along with the high compute machine classes, I would expect to have it, but I'm, I can't say for certain which machines would and would not. Great question because it all depends on it has to have the underlying physical hardware in order for the VM to be able to leverage that. That being said, Darren, do you know of? I do not know off the top of my head. I know there's okay. also different flavors of the OS and whether or not the, you know, various things get enabled in Azure or different timelines then. Yeah, you, know. you just you just reminded me too, it may vary between Linux and Linux distributions. So yeah. that's a great question. I would have to I would have to go and and check on that. But you're getting, what you're getting into is like basically virtualization platform and the underlying hardware support for the various classes of machine in IaaS machines in the Azure cloud. So I would have to, I would have to check with my VM colleagues on that. Okay. Um, okay. We got another it's question. It's a great, really good question, actually. Uh, yeah. Sure. Fire away. Yeah. Okay, so the question is uh, with regards to the hyper buffer pool. Um, does that mean we can move um, more tables into memory? SQL is just going to see it as one contiguous space. So, so you're a, you're able to take advantage of that of that um, 
SQL was able to take advantage of that that space. So the the indirect answer to that is yes, but the reason why is is that SQL is just seeing it as one big contiguous space, right? Which is yeah. yeah. And so then if you if you take advantage of you know PMM and you know like I said up to four terabytes per socket, you can actually get you know really large spaces to put things in memory, right? But yeah. like like Dave said, it just sees it as one big space. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I guess we could, we were ending up with another question with like, you know, if we move to Azure, um, is that just provided as standard? So, I mean, we got into like PaaS and how, how you know, are we getting more efficient yeah. in, so in PaaS <laughs> in performance? Yeah, the question is again, like in, from, from an infrastructure as a service to a platform as a service, and when we say platform as a service, Specifically framed around SQL DB managed in, or managed instance in, in um, you know areas on that side, that would be something that's again underlying hardware. You have to have the hardware to take advantage of it, and that is something I would have to to check with those teams. Um, don't know when I I can't say either way, and that would also you know what what would be disclosed on that. So. Um, Great question. It's it's honestly the same answer I had for the for the IAS question. I don't I don't know, but you would in particular be be leaning, and this is going to be true for any virtualized platform. Your larger memory and compute scenarios is where you're really going to see this shine. Okay, so let me let's do a quick demo. Yeah, I don't got, want um, to. <laughs> Well, we've got another three minutes left, but we've got another question from the floor, so I'm going to have to like eat into your demo time. Just take okay. one more question. Yeah. QMEM and the um, detail and light and um, persisted log buffer, what sort of recovery options you got if you have a complete hardware failure? Okay, so... Oh, this wow, that's a daring yep. question. I think okay. I heard part of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> complete hardware failure, is that what I heard? Yeah. Yep. What sort of recovery so options Yeah, so we could be, we, I think it says something like 20, 20 meg, was it, on um, the log? Um, in oh, demo. the log buffer for yeah. database. So if, yeah, it's, yeah. if there's more than 20 meg, what happens? <laughs> what would happen in a total hardware failure, Darren? What is total, the total hardware failure? As in, like, is that um, you, the, uh, the motherboard won't boot? So or I think you, I think in the <laughs> is that framed around the PMM? So, sorry, PMM. Uh, I'll, I'll let's get back from clarification. So if we're using the storage for um, data file enlightenment, so you got the um, MDF or the LDF on there. If you had a, a complete hardware failure, either the data center went down, you know, what sort of recovery options you got to sort of move over onto a different uh, machine? Right. So um, it's, it's pretty more of like a um, high availability scenario or um, or a DR scenario. So yeah, so, so so you've got that um, a bit of data in the um, in, in the buffer. Um, so when you do um, like a failure, what happens to that data? Um, because you're going to have that data persisted um, in a you know how 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 do you move across uh, regions or um, data centers? Yeah, I, I mean if it's yeah, go, go ahead, Darren. <laughs> I mean, if you're doing your your standard sort of you know replicas, I mean, you would have that yeah. failover. Ags, yeah. Ags, um, but if the hardware, um, you know, if you've got a complete hardware failure, um, uh, I, and the, and the, a system will not. You know, boot back up. I, I, um, I need to clarify, but I, I believe that you're going to have because the memory is encrypted. Um, you, you I mean, if you were to re reboot, if you were to pull the plug on a machine, it's persisted yeah. on the module. Correct. Right. Right. So, so you're persisted physically persisted on the module, and to your point with the replicas and AGs, then you're going to have you're going to have um, DR. DR um, uh, support for those other other machines like it truly is correct me if I'm wrong Darren it is true truly is memory is storage persisted correct. storage yeah yeah okay. but it's persistent to that machine so if the machine won't boot then potentially you I mean you, I don't think you can move like the you know the, the modules to a different machine because they're encrypted I have to get clarification yeah. on that but yeah, and I would, you know, that doesn't, you know, your a, from an HA perspective, it, it doesn't mean it, you you're going to keep your your AG solution. You will still have, you know, if you're yeah. doing, you know, high high availability and all that stuff, you will still have all that data replicated. Yeah. Okay. Um. 
I guess we're out of time, but um, we've got in like in a two more minutes. Um, but um, okay. I think um, like say say if we just on a like a normal server um, and you had a shutdown or, or you know you you, you pull the plug, um, you know tradition says that you know whatever is written to disk is what is um, reread again and then you know the transaction log is reread and yep. uh, you know it'll bring the database back into that point in time and state. But if you've got some of it in memory, I mean, does that? Oh, but for system memory, it's just like storage. It'll come up and it'll, it'll, it'll mm -hmm. so okay. Yep. So so it'll hold that little bit of twenty meg, whatever it was, and the buffer pool as well, as it yep. was. Yep. But but then again, it's the question is like, does the memory buffer pool? Nothing is really true until it's actually hit in, hit, hit into the log. So the little bit of data that you have in the memory pool won't really be in a, in a in a consistent state i guess so well that's that tail of the log scenario so is it like once you say you know you're saying commit it's it's you know that you're getting that scenario um that supported that at that level so sql so you it's persisted Yeah, we're getting the scenario where w at what point does it, com you know, what um, in terms of um, uh, the log being read and then being replicated across um, for high av availability? Um, I, I guess you know where we you know where does the marker sit? Does the marker well, sit? You, you still have the you still have the latency potentially from from your primary to your secondary AGs, um, and there's you know still those factors that apply for always unavailability groups. Okay. Um, but, okay, yeah, but we're for the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've come to the air, sort of like time, so it's like six o'clock. Um, okay. I, I guess, um, you know, if, if, if you're available on um, Twitter or um, somewhere online, we can actually, you know, if anyone's got any questions, do like follow up sure. on. Um, uh, yeah, if you, yeah. If, if you got a slide, just to just just let them know. I, I, I know we didn't cover the demo, but um, yeah, do we do we have time for to go to do the demo really quick, or, or are we at time? Um, we at time. So okay. But anyway, All right. Well, th thank, thank you, you, everyone. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you've got a slide with your um, details and um, feedback, then yeah. Yep. Yeah, we have the 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 QR code there at the the bottom. So here is all the information we have um, to learn more about SQL Server 2022. Um, definitely recommend um, getting all of these great demos. There's some great notebooks that you can leverage. We love using those no notebooks. They're great uh, teaching tools. We're a great walkthrough. And we're continuing to grow that uh, portfolio. And of course, you may have seen these, seen this as well. You know, continue your journey with uh, SQL on Microsoft Learn. So just get started. All you have to do is go to AKMS, Azure SQL Fundamentals. And again, we have the QR code at the bottom of the slide. And um, yeah, I should have a walkthrough too. We're going to do a data exposed session as well coming up soon on um, Intel QAD. And I will be doing a, doing a form of that demo on that, on that platform as well. But thank you, everybody. Appreciate you joining. Awesome, yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's great to see um, yeah the partnership between Intel and uh, Microsoft and uh, bringing in new features. So um, yeah, it'll be great yeah. to uh, follow it up and uh, see where it takes us. Okay, thank All you. All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs>